Hello and welcome to the new Patillo Bridge Project webinar. My name is Robert Willis. I'm the Online Communications Advisor for TransLink. And with me tonight is Sandy Zane. He is the Director of Roads here at TransLink. This webinar is part of a wider consultation process of which we've had four in-person workshops, uh, two of them at, in Surrey and two of them in uh, New Westminster. Where it's also part of this consultation is also the uh, online questionnaire which can be accessed at translink.ca. And if you're joining us online this evening, you can uh, enter in your questions at any time. Um, Sandy will be taking your questions after the presentation. Um, we also have gathered questions from our buzzer blog as well as uh, the in-person workshops. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Sandy, who's going to tell us why we need to replace the existing bridge as well as uh, the different options for a new Patello Bridge. Over to you. Thank you, Robert, and uh, just want to thank all our uh, web viewers tonight for joining us. As Robert mentioned, we've had a series of uh, events with the public, and about 400 to 450 people have mm -hmm. so far joined the conversation on the new Patello Bridge, and we're really pleased to see the high level of engagement. Clearly, this is a very interesting and important project for the region, and uh, we welcome your participation tonight and look forward to your uh, questions. So uh, what we'll do now is in the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, I will go through a um, presentation and present the context and the background to the, to the new Patillo Bridge project. And feel free to send in your questions as this presentation progresses. And then when we're done, we'll have a good uh, 20 minutes to um, answer the questions that come in and questions that Robert has picked up from, from other sources. So um, the new Patillo Bridge project, um, th the story of the, the bridge started in 1937 when this existing bridge that we have today was opened. And um, back in those days, they built bridges to last around 50 years. So this existing structure is now 75 years old. So we've squeezed about uh, 25 years out of its life beyond the original design intent uh, through good maintenance practices. Uh, this bridge is serving about uh, 60,000 uh, crossings a day, uh, which translates to a bit more than 20 million a year uh, mm -hmm. crossings on the existing bridge. Um, about 3,500 trucks are crossing the Patullo Bridge every day, which makes it an important goods movement corridor in the region. We have very low numbers of uh, pedestrians and uh, cyclists using this bridge. Right. And that's a function of the very poor amenities that are currently on the Patillo. Uh, it's, it's an unwelcoming environment, as we call it, for uh, pedestrians and cyclists. And, and that's one thing we certainly want to improve with this project. Uh, safety is a very important issue, and the public has told us that safety is the most important um, objective of a new bridge. Mm -hmm. And as you can see from these numbers, we have now one reported crash every three days uh, on the Patillo Bridge, and approximately one injury crash or one person getting injured every 12 days uh, on the Patillo Bridge. These, these numbers we, we definitely want to pay attention to and, and have a safer uh, crossing when we build a new bridge. If I can interject, you mentioned that <coughs> it was originally designed for 50 years. We've now had it for 75 years. It's still a safe bridge? It's still a safe bridge. Uh, we do what is needed to keep this as a safe crossing for the public. Uh, and we, we maintain it. We monitor it very closely. Mm -hmm. And we invest the necessary amounts every year to keep it a safe crossing. So it's a safe crossing. It needs uh, attention. Uh, mm -hmm. It certainly needs, as the public knows, it needs certain driving habits of driving slowly and paying attention to speed limits. Mm -hmm. uh, but we keep it structurally safe. Okay. Um, in our conversation with the public, we retained the Mastel group to uh, independently survey the region, and we found that 81% of residents in, uh, in Metro Vancouver support the idea of a new Patillo Bridge. And that 81% was consistent in New Westminster, in Surrey, and in the region as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, on this slide, we summarize just the four key challenges associated with the existing bridge. We mentioned user safety, and, and as you know, um, the bridge doesn't have a median barrier, so the two opposing directions of traffic are not separated, mm -hmm. and that, uh, that ha increases the potential for head-on type collisions. Right. It also doesn't have shoulders, it has narrow lanes, and it has two tight horizontal curves. So all, all these factors of the, of the design of this existing bridge contribute to a higher safety risk than we like to see. Mm -hmm. uh, the second challenge is the bridge structure itself. Having been built in the 1930s, 
is now 75 years old. So we're looking at the, the steel components, the concrete uh, structural elements. They're showing their age. They've been subject to weather conditions, the river conditions for 75 years. So those elements are now showing their age being 75 years old. Right. The third uh, challenge we face on the bridge is se seismic vulnerability, or what would happen to the existing Petillo Bridge in the event of an earthquake. Um, in the 1930s, we had a very rudimentary uh, earthquake code to build structures. So this bridge, the existing one, is not built to modern seismic standards. And when we uh, hired experts to tell us what will happen in the event of an earthquake, the answer was, in the event of a moderate earthquake, mm -hmm. it's likely that this existing bridge <coughs> will become impassable. Well, and yeah. given the way the bridge was built, it's very difficult to bring it up to existing seismic standards, even with a lot of investment. Our fourth challenge is a technical one, but, but, but an important one. The action of the riverbed, the, the actual movement of the river and the floor of the river is acting on the pillars of the Patillo Bridge. The scour. The scour, and oh. that's something which um, we have to keep on monitoring because as, the, as that riverbed moves, it affects the pillars and the integrity of the pillars. We have to pay close attention to that, mm -hmm. make sure the pillars are well maintained and are able to fulfill their function. But it is 75 years of river action on, mm -hmm. a, on an old bridge, and it's something we have to keep an eye on. So those are the challenges we're facing with the existing bridge. And we, we've been studying this structure since 2006 is when the planning work started, technical studies since 2008, mm -hmm. to look at what should we do. Should we uh, rehabilitate the existing bridge, kind of be made safer uh, uh, with a rehabilitation without the need for a new bridge? Can we look at uh, putting a new, one new structure in one direction and using the existing structure for the other direction? So we looked at that option. We also looked at the option of replacing both the old Patillo Bridge and the rail bridge ne next to it on mm. a single new structure. Right. So we've looked at a lot of different alternatives, and the outcome of these technical studies showed us that a, a new bridge at this existing crossing location is the best option for the region. Uh, some of the reasons included keeping the existing bridge even for one direction of traffic right. requires a lot of maintenance costs for the future. Uh, rehabilitating the existing bridge will require significant investments, hundreds of millions of dollars, and would still not bring it up to modern seismic standards or impro improve all the safety challenges. Um, another interesting um, exercise we undertook was to look at moving the Patillo Bridge further upstream, as we call it, closer to Coquitlam and moving it uh, closer, closer to where the Port Man Bridge is. As you can see from that graphic, we call this the Sapperton Bar option. Uh, we looked at this very closely, and um, the, the results were not favorable for several reasons. The cost of crossing the river further upstream is two to three times the cost of crossing the river where we are now with the Patillo Bridge due to the width of the river. As, as that graphic clearly shows, the river widens and the wider the river gets, the longer the span, the more expensive the structure. So it became an, a financially not a viable um, location to cross the river. Environmental impacts were significantly higher for the Sapperton Bar alignment because we would be interfering with river operations a lot more than mm -hmm. we would at the existing crossing location. Significant community impacts because the road network is obviously set up to serve the existing location. If we were to move the bridge location further upstream, we'd need to build a whole new road network to serve the new location. That proved to be very disruptive to existing communities. So to build the new roads, we would be disrupting livability in several communities on both shores. And finally, the existing Patillo Bridge is serving demand between Surrey, New Westminster, Burnaby, and Coquitlam. So when we looked at the modeling of traffic movements with a Sapperton Bar alignment, we found longer travel distances. Um, motorists, truckers having to travel longer distances to cross the river and then come back mm. to their origins and destinations. Right. That resulted in worse air quality impacts and higher emissions. So right. the Sapperton Bar option was looked at in detail and it will not be pursued. Uh, we, w we are looking for a new bridge to be adjacent to where the existing bridge is. So in looking at um, what we want the new bridge to do, we have to keep in mind that the new structure will need to serve uh, the region for the next 100 years. We now build bridges to last 100 years. So for mm. example, the new Golden Ears Bridge is designed and built for a 100-year lifespan. 
So we have to be able to look into the future and ask ourselves, what does the region need for the next 100 years? Or to put it into context, the year 2100 is 100 okay. years from now. That's we have to time. ask ourselves, what would be the, the travel demand and, and the, the, what kind of region will this new bridge need to serve? Mm -hmm. So what we do know from the land use planning which is ongoing in, in the region is that we are experiencing growth in the region. It's, it's an attractive region which is growing and all cities in our region are growing. Mm -hmm. So the forecasts are for New Westminster to grow by about 70% only in the next 30 years. So to the year 2041, New Westminster is projecting 70% increase in population mm -hmm. and 70% increase in employment. Across the river in Surrey, the, the projections are even higher, about 80% increase in population in the next 30 years and 100% increase in employment numbers in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we have two growing, thriving communities on each side of the Patillo Bridge, and that's great for the economy. It generates economic growth. It also generates the need for mobility. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we looked at what, will, what do we expect people to do in the future, um, the good news is a lot more travelers will be choosing more sustainable modes. So transit, using buses, uh, biking, as, as the, both cities densify, walking become more viable modes. But we still see a, a high demand for travel by vehicle. Hmm. So we're expecting in 30 years time to see approximately a 50% increase in the demand for travel by automobile on this Petrolu Bridge. 50% uh, sounds like a big number mm -hmm. until we compare it to 70% growth in New Westminster sure. and 80 to 100% growth in Surrey. So what we're finding is a lot more travel is being picked up by transit and other sustainable modes, but we're still having growth in auto travel demand. Mm -hmm. um, and we assess the origins and destinations. TransLink conducts uh, travel surveys and we ask travelers um, where are their origins and destinations of trips. People who cross the Petulu Bridge are local. So this bridge is serving local communities, uh, local trips between Surrey on one side and New Westminster, Burnaby, Coquitlam on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, that we expect that to continue to be the case in the future as a lot of local trips are made across this bridge. Uh, we're expecting about 70% on the North Shore to be Burnaby New West traffic and about 70% on the so South Shore to be Surrey traffic. So when we're looking for the future requirements, we have to keep this picture in mind as to what the new bridge needs to serve in the future. Given this context, we've established just six bullets which will guide this project for the new Patillo Bridge, and these are what we call the objectives uh, for the project. So first and foremost, we're looking for a safe crossing. So we want mm -hmm. a new bridge that's designed, built, and operated in accordance with modern safety guidelines. We've come a long way since 1937, yep. and the new bridge will have more comfortable lanes, shoulders, a median barrier, and all the safety amenities that we expect in, in a new facility. Second is we want reliability. We, we want a bridge where travelers know how long it will take to cross and that we don't have what we call unexpected congestion, mm -hmm. which throws people off schedule, makes you late for work, makes you late for school. We want to make it a reliable crossing. Third thing, we want effective connections. We have a, we have a major road network which we want to connect effectively mm -hmm. so people can get onto the major roads and travel effectively between communities. So what does that mean? It means on the Surrey side, we're looking for connections to things like King George Boulevard, Scott Road, and the new South Fraser Perimeter Road. Mm -hmm. On the new Westminster side, we're looking for connections to McBride, Royal, and Columbia, mm -hmm. what we call the major road network. And we want to make sure that we're thinking ahead to a 100-year time frame and providing these efficient connections. We want to keep our economy moving. So we know that trucks use this bridge and it will remain an important goods movement corridor. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that trucks can efficiently come on and get off this bridge while staying on the major road network. So we want to do our best to make sure that the new bridge serves goods movement and keeps them off local roads and outside the communities. TransLink has a sustainability policy. We also have a long range transportation strategy. Metro Vancouver has a regional growth strategy. All these documents are online. Mm -hmm. And I, I would encourage our viewers to have a look online and see what these documents say, because this new bridge will be designed in cons con considering all these good regional strategies. Finally, we have a financial responsibility. Yes. We, 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 we're using our tax, collective tax dollars here. And so we need to make sure that we are building and operating and designing a bridge in a financially prudent manner. Right. So these are, in, in summary, our objectives, <coughs> and f as we proceed with this project, these are the key objectives we'll keep in mind in all our decisions. Right. 
And you mentioned the website. We've already had 300 uh, plus page views. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, I would highly suggest you do. All these things will be uh, living there, including this webinar afterwards. Excellent, good. And I'll also mention, uh, Robert, we have an FAQ, frequently yes. asked questions online. So if um, any anything which you can't find an answer for today, have a look at the FAQ. And you might find the answer there. Um, in terms of how many lanes we want yes. the new bridge to, to, to provide, and this has been a very uh, popular question that yeah. we've been getting, we have done um, three levels of due diligence on this issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Dating back to 2006, we reviewed the issue of laning extensively and looked at a variety of laning options. And the objectives that I mentioned before, safety, reliability, connectivity, goods movement, and sustainability, right. we looked at evaluating different laning options to see what works best. Mm -hmm. And we've landed on a new six-lane bridge. Um, it, it serves the purposes of the region for the next 100 years much better than a new four-lane bridge. Some of the key items that uh, are better served by a six-lane bridge, one is, number one, is safety. We find that one of the main reasons for many of the crashes that happen on the Patillo Bridge are due to traffic having to squeeze in to the number of lanes. Merging, right. weaving, lane changing, as trucks and vehicles have to squeeze in to the number of lanes available. By having a six lane bridge, the flow of traffic is much smoother. The number of lane changes and weaving movements are much less, right. and we, we, we would have a much safer bridge. And safety is our number one objective. Uh, reliability, without, uh, without the ad added lane, we will see a lot more um, congestion on both sides of the bridge. Congestion means traffic standing still, mm -hmm. uh, emitting pollutants in the, both communities, in Surrey and in New Westminster. With a six-lane bridge, we can get the traffic on the bridge and off the bridge much uh, more smoothly and reduce um, the congestion and uh, unpredictability of travel time. Very important for us is to connect efficiently to the road network and maintain efficient connections, keeping in mind that 100-year time frame. Right. So we have major roads on both shores um, and um, on, on, on the Surrey side, as I mentioned, King George, Scott, and the South Fraser Perimeter Road in New Westminster, East Columbia, McBride, and Royal. And we want efficient connections with all the major roads, and six lanes allow us to do that, much more so than four lanes. Movement of goods. If we stick with four lanes, we'll be asking truckers to travel longer distances to mm -hmm. get on and off the bridge, and, we, and they'll be idling a lot more. So for the movement of goods and for air quality, having six lanes keeps the goods moving more efficiently mm -hmm. and improves air quality, which is the last point on this table. Hmm. Um, we, this public consultation process, this webinar, and the meetings that we've had is the start of a two-year process. Uh, we are now in spring 2012, and we're having this engagement with the public and getting terrific feedback. This is the start of the conversation. We have a lot of work to do uh, in the next two years. That includes developing the design, doing a comprehensive environmental assessment, and doing all the preliminary site investigations that we need to do. Throughout that work for the next two years, there will be engagement with the public and mm -hmm. continuous uh, feedback coming back and forth. And as the design progresses, we'll continue to engage with the public and get their input uh, on this project. So this will be a two-year process of TransLink asking for comments and feedback and input as this project progresses before we are even at the request for qualification stage. And when are we going to be back out again um, asking people for their feedback and consultation after tonight's webinar and such? We will now be taking back all the feedback we've received over the last three weeks. We'll be assessing it and distilling it and uh, reacting to it and fine-tuning our options. And then we'll be going back to the public in the spring, late, late spring, mm -hmm. to show them the results of what we heard, how, how the input that they provided allowed us to fine-tune the options and the concepts. And we will be sharing that with the public in the spring. Good. Thanks. In the meantime, as the residents of New Westminster know, there's a master transportation plan ongoing, and um, we are participating on that process. And everything we learned from our new Patillo Bridge process, we are providing as input to New Westminster in the development of a master transportation plan. The master transportation plan has bigger, bigger questions being asked for the entire community, much beyond just the Patillo Bridge. And what we're learning through this process, we're feeding into the master transportation plan process. Uh, we continue to work with both cities, mm -hmm. Surrey and New Westminster, on this process and keeping each other informed of progress. Zooming out on this schedule, just to see the big picture, we're expecting uh, 
construction activity on the new bridge to start around 2016 and a two to three year construction window. So new bridge opening sometime in 2018. So between now and then we have to complete the activities I mentioned before, uh, operational level analysis, design, environmental assessment and certification. We have to do a request for qualifications, request for proposals, assess qualified teams who will build the bridge, and maybe shovels in the ground we're thinking around 2016. Lots of work we'll Lots to be work. done. Lots of work to be done before, before we see actual construction activity. I'll now cover a little bit the options, the conceptual options, and keeping in mind these are conceptual, and this is what we've been asking the public to comment on. There are different ways that we can have the connections uh, on either side of the bridge connect with the local roads. And we've been sharing with the public some of the ideas we came up with and asking for comments and feedback, and we've gotten a terrific response so far. This is on the New Westminster side, what we call option A. And I'll say that all the red lines are the more regional roads and the, more, uh, the roads designed for more regional traffic movements. And the green lines are the more local roads serving local traffic movements, should this option be selected. I'll also point out here, our viewers can see that the bridge in this case is upstream, what we call upstream of the existing Patula Bridge. Mm -hmm. And there are, that's why it's called on the top of the slide, upstream option A. Right. And there are some options which are downstream, as we'll see in a minute. What's interesting about this concept is it connects uh, Columbia, East Columbia, with Royal. So mm -hmm. Columbia and Royal, which are both on the major road network, become a continuous road. Yeah. So this option makes it easy to stay on the major road network and discourages traffic from continuing on the rest of Columbia and then Front Street. Mm. So this allows major traffic to stay on the major roads. And uh, viewers can probably also see the direct ramps from the new bridge onto Columbia. So the outside lane on the new bridge will go straight onto Columbia, and the outside lane on the bridge heading towards Surrey will be fed directly from Columbia. So we're not expecting any impacts on McBride and Royal by having a six-lane bridge. The mm. connections to McBride and Royal will pretty much be the same as today. And what the new outside lanes will do is to serve the movement to and from Columbia a lot more efficiently than today. And uh, as we go through these, it's also important to remember that the existing Patello Bridge will be, still be in service while construction starts. That's an excellent point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, we, uh, obviously, we cannot build the new bridge exactly where the existing bridge is. Yeah. We yeah. want to build the new bridge adjacent to the existing bridge. Uh, we're thinking we have about a 100-meter envelope on, on each side. Okay. Yeah. And so we'll build the new bridge, make it functional, and then tear down the old bridge. Uh, moving on to what we call downstream option A. This is very similar to the previous slide, and the only difference here that the viewers will notice is that the new bridge will be downstream of the existing Patillo Bridge. Otherwise, the concept is the same. Columbia connects to Royal, and we have direct connection ramps uh, from and to the bridge to uh, Columbia Street. Moving to a different option, this is what we call upstream option B. And this one is very similar to the, today's condition. Uh, you notice almost the new roads overlap exactly with the existing uh, road mm -hmm. network. The only difference being a new loop ramp uh, from Columbia onto the bridge uh, to replace the ramp, which we now mostly have to close during peak periods because it's substandard. So this is almost overlaying the new connections with the existing road connections and keeping everything else just about the same with the bridge slightly shifted upstream of the existing alignment. Okay. Moving on to option C. Option C is quite different. Uh, this option has more direct ramp movements, and this requires some significant infrastructure. So yeah. this has some multi-level uh, roadways and multi-level stacking of roads uh, to make all the movements work. And as you can see here, we have significant more work on McBride, and this may require some uh, trenching of McBride in order to make all the movements work. So it's a very compact design. You see there aren't any loops here outside the immediate footprint, mm -hmm. but it is also a expensive, um, expensive configuration, and it, it also has some aesthetic impacts in the sense that a lot of uh, viewpoints will begin to look more like a major road construction okay. com compared to today's condition. And this option has both a, another uh, variation, which is downstream, again, similar concept, but now the new bridge is downstream of the existing bridge. Moving to option D in New Westminster. This is what we call the McBride option. Uh, as you can notice here, the new bridge is lined up directly with McBride Avenue. So we line up the bridge to have a very straight alignment with McBride. 
what this means is that McBride will see a lot of regional traffic uh, mm -hmm. uh, along uh, the frontage of Victoria Hill. This also means that McBride will need to be trenched in order to make the grades work. So to make the, uh, the transition from the bridge to McBride work, this will require a trenching of McBride for the traffic to be able to meet up with the city streets. So uh, this option, while it, it reduces impacts on other roads, it has some significant impacts on McBride itself. This is upstream, and now we move across the river to Surrey. Mm -hmm. Surrey has um, a, a couple of major variations on the options. We call this one upstream A. And the main uh, idea in Surrey is to make the, the, the connection between King George and Scott Road much easier than it is today. Today we have five lanes coming together at Scott Road and King George and a lot of jockeying for position, lane changing, weaving and merging. Right. So with this option, uh, there is an interchange to connect Scott Road with King George. Mm -hmm. Again, the red lines are for regional traffic and the uh, uh, green lines are for local traffic. With this concept, a new regional road is built connecting King George with the new South Fraser perimeter uh, road, which is the blue line on this graphic. So that line along 124th, which is red, would be a new regional link. Mm -hmm. Adjacent to it is a green line to create a local road for local traffic only for the neighborhood on uh, the south side uh, of, of, um, of 124th. What is also note, uh, note, to be noted on this slide are the direct connections to South Fraser Perimeter Road. Okay. So trucks to and from um, the south of, on this slide will be coming to the South Fraser Perimeter Road directly onto okay. and off of the bridge. So we'll have a direct connection. Again, this reduces the need for, for trucks to travel on the local road network, mm -hmm. and it keeps the trucks on the major roads. And the trucks will come off and on South Fraser Perimeter Road to the outside lanes on the Patillo Bridge. This is upstream. Downstream option A is very similar concept, but uh, the new bridge will be downstream of the existing Patillo Bridge. Otherwise, the concept is the same. And the only other major variation in Surrey is what we call option B. You'll notice here the interchange between Scott Road and King George is what we call a classic diamond interchange. There is no loop. It's a fairly minor variation. Uh, and what this does is uh, it, uh, it makes the, uh, more land availability and it, it less land being used for uh, actual road work mm -hmm. uh, by having a tighter footprint for that interchange. Traffic still works. It doesn't work as efficiently. This will require one more traffic light. But otherwise, it's, a, um, it's, it's equally functional as the other option. Again, this has an upstream variation and a downstream variation. This concludes our slides. So how many options were there in total? It's quite a few. Yeah, quite a few. We have about uh, six or seven in New West and about four in, in Surrey. And is there any consideration for, um, you talked about some of the uh, different routes mirrored some of the existing routes already today. Does that factor into the, the options that we're presenting people, or is that just one of the components? It's one of the components. The, 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 obviously, there will be construction management and traffic advisories and so on when we get into construction, alerting motorists as to how the new construction will link in with the existing roads. So um, everything we're showing, all the concepts we're presenting are still at the conceptual stage. We'll need to work on the actual laning and make sure that uh, the details of how the lanes would work will be fleshed out in the next mm. stage, which we, we call the operational stage. Fantastic. So this is the time in the webinar where we're going to be taking your questions. So if you're walking, uh, watching online, you can um, type them in right now, and we'll be taking those. We'll also be um, sprinkling in a few questions that we got at the in-person workshops, as well as a couple of questions that I received uh, via the buzzer blog. So the first one we're going to field today is um, one we got online from somebody watching right now. And the question is, a park idea was proposed for the Portman Bridge, but was rejected. Uh, would that be a possibility here? Great question. Yeah. Um, and um, this has been proposed in, in many different ways. Can we use the existing bridge as a park? Can we use it for pedestrians and cyclists only? Mm -hmm. Basically, what can we do to keep the, the existing bridge functional? We, we haven't looked at that in detail yet. It's still okay. early days. But what we do know is that keeping the existing bridge safe mm -hmm. and functional and open to the public requires a lot of maintenance dollars every year. Oh. So even if, if it was only a park or even if it's only available to pedestrians and cyclists, we need to make sure that the structural integrity is looked after. First. And, and that requires a significant amount of dollars to keep safe. 
So even if, it, if it's not open to traffic, it still needs to be structurally sound. And that will be probably one factor which will uh, work against keeping the existing bridge open for any reason. Okay. And we have another one, and um, <clears throat> this one about the bridge itself. Um, were 50-year life, life, life cycles common at the time of the bridge construction? Can't it be dramatically extended if we want to, like other bridges, around the world? Good question. Yeah, yeah 50 years was probably ambitious uh, in, in, in the 1930s. Uh, some bridges have lasted longer, some have not lasted as long. Mm -hmm. um, we looked very closely at the option of rehabilitating this bridge and extending its life further. We've gotten 25 years out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. over the 50 years now. And we looked at the issue of can we throw more money at it and, and make it live longer. And the results were, given the way it was constructed in the 1930s, mm. we'd need to spend around $200 million. We still would not be able to make it meet modern seismic standards. Right. And we would not be able to um, uh, provide the necessary width to provide safe operations. Mm. So while some rehabilitation can be done, we would still be well short of what we'd expect a modern bridge to be able to serve the region. We still also won't be able to get a, a dramatically extended life out of that rehabilitation. So we might get another 20 or 25 years, at which point we'll be where we are now, looking at another solution. So we'll be spending hundreds of millions of dollars and get a, a, a bridge which still has seismic and safety issues and a limited lifespan. So refurbishing the existing one would kind of almost be a band-aid it, it would be throwing a lot of money at a very old structure. Very old structure. Fair enough. Uh, and we have another question, and um, that is, will building a bigger bridge generate more traffic? So good good question, question. Yeah. and, 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 so, and something of, of interest to, to mm -hmm. I know, a lot of people in the region. Yes. Uh, one thing which we have to make very clear, there is a, there is a network surrounding the Patillo Bridge, a network of roadways. Mm -hmm. The reason TransLink owns this bridge is because we don't look after highways or freeways. We look right. after infrastructure in a municipal context, and so there are uh, road, um, arterial roads in both Surrey and New Westminster where traffic lights control the flow of traffic. Right. So what we're doing by going to a six-lane bridge is making traffic flow smoother. We're not opening any of the valves that surround the bridge on either side of the actual bridgehead itself. Even South Fraser Perimeter Road, as many people know, will have traffic lights on it. So while we will have smoother traffic, l uh, less delays, we will have less congestion, we'll have less idling. By going to six lanes, what we're primarily doing is ensuring much fewer lane change maneuvers, much smoother operations, and much less safety risks on the new structure. Okay. Next question is, I'm very concerned about the possible encroachment on Queen's Park in New Westminster. Can you comment on this? Good, and, and I'm, I'm glad that question came up. What, this is one of our main objectives, is to minimize the footprint of the new bridge on both sides of the river. And avoiding encroachment into Queen's Park is something which we have as a primary objective. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the options we showed on New Westminster, which is, I believe, option D, the McBride um, alignment, may have to encroach into Queen's Park, and that's something which works against that option. The other options that we showed there are very unlikely to have any impact on Queen's Park. Uh, at the conceptual stage, our designers have worked very hard to avoid park impacts and to keep the footprint of the bridge very tight, very compact, and very urban. The next question uh, was one that uh, is very apt for something as large as a bridge. What is the financial plan? Good question. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we need a new bridge and we need to pay for it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what we know, Robert, is that we need a new bridge. We know that. Okay. And what we obviously know is that we need to find a way to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Our exercise in this spring of 2012 is to ask the public for help in scoping what the new bridge looks like. So the issues about how to connect the bridge to the road network, what is important to the community, is what we need to pin down now. And that's what we call scoping. Hmm. With that done, we'll be able to do the downstream impacts and upstream impacts and do the operational reviews, which will result in other mitigation measures, which we need to include in the project scope. Hmm. And what, the reason all that's important is that that contributes to the cost of the project. How we connect, what are the operational impacts, and how we mitigate them has a significant influence on the cost of the project. Right. So once we have the scope set, we'll be having a conversation about funding. Hmm. What we know is that um, we will be talking with various levels of government to see how, what are the different ways we can 
fund in Newbridge. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, in the absence of alternative funding, we may be looking at user tolls, but that is a conversation to be had after we're done the scoping to know what it is that we want to build mm -hmm. and to know how much it will cost. Okay, and that's actually one of the questions we have. Will a new bridge be tolled? So I, I, that's yep. sort of part of my, yep. uh, my previous answer. It is one of the options, of the options. but it's a, it's a conversation that will be had and we'll be having that conversation with the public in the future our first step is to define the scope and understand what this new bridge will look like, how will it connect to the community, because that will contribute to the cost of the project. A question akin to that that I see online quite often is, is there a possibility that the existing Patilla Bridge will be tolled? Uh, we have no plan no to plan? toll the existing Patilla Bridge. Okay. Uh, we, we, we have absolutely no plan to do that. All right. Um, how, here's another question we have from somebody online. How many lanes, walkways, bike lanes? So we talked about the laning. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for traffic, uh, we're looking at a six-lane bridge. Uh, the two outside lanes will be designated for truck priority movements. So we're okay. expecting the two outside lanes will mainly be used by the trucking community, and the, two, uh, the other two lanes in each direction will be used for general purpose traffic. For the bike lanes and pedestrian walkways, the best example we can give is to look at the amenities on the Golden Ears Bridge. That will be our standard, and we'd want to either meet that or improve upon it. Okay. So we want this to be a very comfortable bridge for, for cycling and for walking. We think we can be having between one and 2,000 crossings by bike and on foot daily. Mm. And you saw the statistics earlier. Today we have around 50, which is a very, very low number. So we think we have two thriving communities on either end. We want to provide comfortable amenities for walking and for biking on this bridge and make sure the connections work. We have the BC Parkway. We have the Central Valley Greenway. We want to provide efficient connections to the, bi to the bike uh, amenities on both sides and make this an attractive crossing mm -hmm. for non-auto modes. So there will be some sort of separation between, say, bike lanes? Of course, and, yes. We, we'll, we'll, we'll be having uh, modern guidelines and modern standards applied to the new crossing to make it a comfortable environment for biking and for walking. Great. Um, if you have any more questions, please submit them uh, via the uh, interface for the webinar. Um, I've been collecting questions uh, throughout the last couple of weeks when I first posted on this on the Buzzer blog. Um, one question that, that I've seen coming up uh, a couple times is uh, what noise and uh, visual mitigation measures will TransLink provide um, during the construction or even when this the bridge is uh, completed? Good. That, that's a great question. And I, I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things we need to do in the coming couple of years is the environmental assessment. And that's where we will be looking at the impacts of the new bridge, including during construction, mm -hmm. to look at how can we mitigate the impacts of this project. And that includes visual intrusion, it includes noise, it includes air quality. What are the features we can put uh, on the new bridge and during construction to mitigate those impacts? This environmental assessment includes a lot of public consultation and engagement with the community. So this is something where we'll be coming back to the public and engaging with them on the different ways we can do this. Mm -hmm. Our main objective in doing that is to have a bridge that the community can be proud of, that integrates with the community, and that, that enhances the community and livability on both shores. You know, one, uh, another question I just saw pop up today was, what, why can't we just get rid of the existing bridge? not replace the bridge at all. Yeah. We, we hear that. <laughs> yeah, we, do, yeah. <laughs> we hear that from, mm -hmm. from a few people have, have yeah. suggested that. Yeah. Robert, we have uh, 20 million users a year on the Patilla Bridge. Right. Those are the, the residents and the families of New Westminster and Surrey and Burnaby and Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. To suggest that we not replace the bridge is suggesting that 20 million users a year have to find another way to cross the Fraser River, mm -hmm. which means they're traveling through local neighborhoods, they're rat running, they're using roads, they're overloading other roads, they're traveling through other communities, they're, they're traveling longer distances, incurring more expense and emitting more pollutants. Okay, so yeah. we, have a, we have a very key uh, part of our network. The Patillo Bridge is serving a very important function to the families and the businesses uh, and the communities of New Westminster, Surrey, Burnaby, and Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the numbers of you know, 20 million trips a year uh, say their own story. Right. More questions about uh, the position of the bridge or having the bridge. Uh, you have three bridges in the same area. This is coming from online. The Portman, Alex Fraser, and the Patello. Have you considered moving more west, for example, to Burn Road in Burnaby? Yep. Uh, we've, we've looked at different uh, locations to, uh, co to connect the bridge. The, the issue of the, um, the ideal river crossing location mm -hmm. always comes up. Where we are now, the reason the Patillo Bridge and the Skytrain Bridge and the Rail Bridge are where they are is because that's the narrow point of the river. 
and, and that makes it uh, the, the, the easiest place to build a bridge. As soon as the river widens, we're looking at significantly higher costs. Mm. And the same issues I mentioned earlier about the origins and destinations of the people using the bridge, when we move it away from its current location, we immediately incur longer travel distances, uh, longer commutes for the users of this bridge. Right. Uh, that uh, translates to also worse air quality impacts. Gotcha. Uh, is there a possibility, this is sorry, another question from online, this is a fantastic question so far. Is there a possibility of the Stormont McBride, I hope I'm connect, uh, pronouncing that correctly, connector being built in conjunction, in con conjunction with the Patello Bridge project? Yep. Excellent question. Uh, thank you um, for the viewer who sent that in. We will not be precluding the Stormont McBride connector with any uh, new Patello Bridge design that, that we implement. We, okay. We're aware that this project, while it's not on anyone's books at the moment, it's always been talked about, so we won't do anything to preclude it, mm -hmm. and we'll make sure that if it comes online in the future, it can be accommodated. At this time, the, the Stormont McBride connector is not a project neither with the provincial government nor with TransLink, but we're aware it's out there. It may come into being in the future. We'll make sure that our design does not preclude it. Okay. Also from uh, online here we have, why can't TransLink build a tunnel instead of a bridge? Actually, I think this one came from one of our workshops. Yep. Good, good question again. Uh, again, it, it, it's, a, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And it's when, when we look at the, um, the practicality of building a tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, to have the grades work, to be able to go under the river and then come back out in the community would effectively be tunneling um, very long distances at exorbitant costs. Right. So, um, so the, the, the tunnel alignment would, would effectively mean we're building a massive tunnel, which immediately becomes unaffordable to be able to go b down and then back up again. When you say massive cost, double? Triple. Triple. Triple or more. Yes. That is massive. <laughs> okay. Um, here's something else that also came from one of our workshops. Uh, how does the four versus six lane options compare to one another? Good question. And, and we touched a little bit on that yeah. in the presentation. Four lanes does not serve the region uh, for the next hundred years. Uh, what we found with four lanes is safety will be worse, reliability will be worse, connectivity will, will be worse, mm -hmm. and air quality will be worse. Our main objective here is safety. We need to reduce the amount of lane changing and weaving that traffic is experiencing today. And with the new four lane bridge, although the four lanes may be wider, the amount of lane changing and weaving will remain. And that includes significant truck lane changing movements. We know that crashes and safety are very much linked to lane change movements and having to squeeze into a lane and then out of it again, all these weaving and lane changing movements have a detrimental impact on safety. Mm. So to serve the region for the next 100 years, a six lane bridge with the outside lanes designated for track priority dramatically reduces the amount of lane changing and weaving. Mm -hmm. And by having these outside lanes immediately peel off onto and uh, from Columbia um, in New Westminster, that makes the truck traffic more rationalized and less likely to travel within the community. So we keep the trucks moving on the major road network and we discourage them from using roads such as 8th in New Westminster by allowing them to use Columbia much more comfortably. We have a few minutes left in the webinar, so if you still have your questions, please type them in so we can answer them. Um, one question that I've um, picked up here um, on the buzzer blog and also I've seen in other uh, venues is, what will the actual bridge look like? Will it be a cabled bridge? Will it be an arch type bridge? Have we gone that far yet? Great question, and it's early days yet. Okay. Uh, th th when, we, when we get into uh, looking for which company or which consortium will build the bridge, we'll be having that conversation, and that may be something where we'll ask for the public's opinions mm. on what, what would they like the bridge to look like and see if we can include that in the specifications for the bridge. So as I mentioned, we, we're not looking to start construction until around uh, 2016. So we have a lot of time to get into those conversations. We're still at what we call conceptual planning. Mm -hmm. As you saw, the options are lines on aerial drawings. We haven't yet even gotten down to the uh, laning diagrams yet. But in the future, there'll be conversations about what the community would like the bridge to look like, and we'll see if we can have uh, those specifications in the request for proposal documentation. So another question from online. With projects like TransLink's Golden Ears Bridge and Australia's CLEM7, C-L-E-M-7 tunnel, not generating the traffic and tolls expected, uh, how can we justify building a bigger, more expensive 
Teller Bridge structure? Good. Yeah, good question. We, we, we hear that a lot here, right? Uh, one little known fact about the Golden Ears Bridge is it's already serving uh, 11 million crossings a year. Oh, okay. So, yeah. we, we, so we talked about Patillo, uh, you know, being a, a 75 year old bridge serving about um, uh, 20 million a year. Mm -hmm. Golden Ears Bridge is already at 11 million a year serving a much further east uh, alignment and much less density mm -hmm. compared to Patillo Bridge. So while Golden Ears Bridge has been slow to match uh, forecasts which were done, it is actually serving 11 million crossings a year uh, and and we know that those uh, those customers are very pleased with that bridge uh, once again as I mentioned we're looking to build a, a, a bridge that will serve the region for the next 100 years mm -hmm. uh, we know that growth has been coming we also the census results that were released a couple of weeks ago growth is coming to our region and the forecasts are growth will continue to come we do not want by any way to over design this bridge we don't want a big bridge that is not needed. We okay. do want a safe bridge. Mm -hmm. We do want a reliable bridge, and we want a bridge that has good connections uh, with the surrounding road network. Okay, we're running out of time, but if you have any last-minute questions, please submit them. Um, here's one right now. Uh, could there be bus expansion over the bridge? Okay. Good question. Um, the Patillo Bridge, as, as you know, is uh, parallel to one of our highest uh, corridors for transit, which is the Expo mm -hmm. Line uh, Bridge. So we have yes. very good transit um, service uh, across this, uh, this part of the Fraser River. And our forecasts show that uh, volumes on SkyTrain on that Expo Line Bridge will continue to increase, and we're expecting them to double in the next 30 years. So, and that's, that's great. The new bridge will obviously be able to accommodate bus traffic should that become part of the region plan in the future. Mm -hmm. At this time, we're serving the majority of our transit customers on that SkyTrain Bridge. Okay, and here's one that we got from the um, workshops. What is the plan for dealing with truff, tr uh, truck traffic, especially when it is proposed that the outer two lanes be truck lanes? Yep. Uh, yeah, that, that's really part, a, a big part of what we're aiming for here is yeah. to have rational truck movements. And the main reason for the outside lanes being truck priority lanes is to minimize lane changing and weaving movements and directing trucks to and from New Westminster to remain on Columbia East, to avoid McBride, avoid Ape, and encourage trucks to be on Columbia to and from New Westminster. So we only want trucks to go into New Westminster if they need to, mm -hmm. and if they're coming and going to Coquitlam or points east, we'd like them to be on Columbia Street and having that direct access from the outside lanes on and off at the bridge. Fantastic. Well, that's about all the time we have for tonight's webinar. If you did submit a question and we haven't been able to answer it yet, um, we will be getting back to you via the email that you did provide when you signed up for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to also stress that um, there's all this, much of this information tonight, it, actually this whole presentation, is going to be on the Patillo Bridge section of the translink.ca. Also, there is the online questionnaire, um, and so we really encourage you to fill that out. And uh, we'd also like to thank you for joining us tonight. We will be coming back, as you mentioned, sometime uh, in, the spring. in the spring. And thank you so much, and have a great evening. Thank you. Well, let me down to